if you treat your audience like they're dummies, they're going to turn off. But when you treat an audience with respect and give them something intelligent, something to chew on, then that, that's what makes you know, longevity and a great show. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to another installment of Jam More Interviews. I'm your host, Josh, aka Jam More, and today I will be speaking to the voice of Deathstroke, the voice of Norman Osborn in Spider-Man PS4 and Spider-Man Miles Morales, Lex Luthor in Young Justice and Injustice. He appeared in the films Saw and Aliens and done so much more work. Ladies and gentlemen, can I get a rounding rouse of applause for the amazing, the humble, the talented man, Mark Ralston. Let's go. Awesome. Thank you. How are you doing today? Hey, man. Doing great. Just been looking forward to this uh, this interview with you. That really means a lot to me. Well, before I get into the question and stuff I'm going to say, I just want to say thank you so much for joining me today. It is an absolute honor and a privilege to be able to speak to you. I've been a fan of yours for a very long time, and it's really such an honor to be able to bring you on, and thank you so much. So, oh, man, thank you, thank you. Thanks for thinking of me. There's some things that some fans might not know about you, and I wrote some down here because I thought they were pretty interesting. <laughs> this one I found really cool. In an interview, you said you lied about your role in Revolution in order to get the part in the film <laughs> Aliens. Can you go more into that for people? Absolutely, and it is true. <laughs> you know, when you when you walk into an audition room, quite often they ask you the proverbial, so what have you been up to, right? And I had just come off the movie Revolution, which was directed by Hugh Hudson, famous director. He directed Chariots of Fire. And uh, I really knew nothing of Jim Cameron, even though I had seen Terminator. I hadn't, uh, I knew nothing of him or Gail Ann Hurd. And my first meeting was with Gail. I don't know what possessed me. But I, when she asked me the question, I launched into this, must have been, it felt like it was about a 20-minute diatribe about my role in Revolution. And I, I made it sound as though I had the next biggest role to Al Pacino. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it just sort of came trippingly off the tongue, and I just went with it. And it worked because, you know, about a week later, I get a call to say, hey, now you get to meet Jim Cameron. So um, the lie was effective. I have admitted it to Gail. I did tell her years later that that's what I'd done. But <laughs> I don't know what possessed me, man. It just it just came out and it sounded good. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all glad that you did because obviously you appeared in Aliens, which is a smash hit film. I mean, people consider that one of the top science fiction movies of all time and people love it and it's, it's it's just highly regarded by fans and i regard it by me as well I freaking love that movie the movie scared me as a little kid um because my mom <laughs> would always play horror movies and i'd come in the room and i'd stick around and she didn't kick me out so i'd have nightmares for days because she never kicked me out of the room there you go but i yeah. remember that movie it's a classic i mean it, it holds up today interesting point for you know you and the fans out there uh, uh watching and listening um, you know, the budget on Aliens was only $18 million. Now, I say eight, only $18 million, But if you compare that to today's budgets for a, you know, for a sci-fi blockbuster, the, it would have been, eight, you know, $180 million. So uh, quite extraordinary how Jim Cameron, who is a cinematic genius, you know, he was able to pull off a lot of old-fashioned lighting and camera movement combined with, the brilliant miniatures and sets of the wonderful, God rest his soul, Stan Winston. So, um, you know, it's amazing when you watch Aliens because there's no CGI. <laughs> there's no digital tricks. It's just old-fashioned filmmaking, and it's amazing that, you know, it stands up the way it does. In fact, I saw it maybe, I'd say, a year and a half ago, and, uh, yeah, before COVID, but um, we were just shocked because it's flawless. I mean, it really is flawless. There isn't a moment when you go, oh, that's a, that's a miniature shot. You can't tell. And that's really, really impressive. And I'm really glad it still holds up because when you go back and look at some of the older movies, you could definitely see the age or you could be like, oh, this, you cringe a little bit. Like, <laughs> you know, you're, you're really like, oh, this, this is definitely of the, of the age. So um, yeah. uh, another thing that some might know is that you had a co-starring role in the fifth and sixth installment of the Saw films. So what was that like to be part of such a massive franchise? There are tons of Saw movies. 
Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, I got to say, um, I when I was first offered, I was offered like a three picture deal. Um, sadly, I wasn't in number seven. But um, when I first read the script and watched, especially well, number one and number four, you know, the thing that impressed me was that there's a real psychology behind these movies. So it wasn't just, you know, I mean, it, it, it is a, you know, a blood fest. <laughs> you know? And, you know, obviously the traps are the, a really extraordinary sort of, you know, trick that they were able to hang the entire uh, series of films on. But it really was the fact that underneath all that, there was this psychology uh, and reality that I responded to. Um, and then, man, when I went on set in Toronto, the special effects head and department, these were real artists. I mean, I watched, I went in one day when I wasn't working just to see. And the setup was, was the opening of Saw 5. You know, the guy's strapped to a table and there's a huge pendulum saw blade, you know, that is swinging above him. And the guy gets eviscerated, you know, and you see the, the gore and the guts falling out. And I swear to you, I thought I was going to throw up and faint because it looks so real, even though I watched them put the guy into the set. And I watched them attach the fake stomach to his upper body i watched it all but then when it started happening all that was suspended and i i was right there in the middle of it so you automatically knew that these guys were true artisans and uh it was so real that um i just knew it was going to do well because that, that that's the way movies are if, if you're on a set and something you know impacts you that viscerally usually it comes off on screen so yeah. Yeah, I, I could only imagine seeing that in like full. I think I'd freak out like every second. I I, saw, I stumbled upon something like, I, gosh, I remember one scene I saw. I can't remember what movie, what Saw movie was from, but it was like this trap that I think it was like, if it like it like snapped your jaw off or something, and right. I was just like, I could imagine just being the actor on there and just seeing uh. it like happen. You'd be. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what I would do. I don't now, know what I would do. <laughs> now, you see, and the cool thing about my character was, which I was grateful for, was that I never had to participate in any of the trap stuff. So, A, I didn't have to get covered in blood until my final death scene when uh, the same special effects guys, they got very uh, uh, carried away with the moment. <laughs> and... <laughs> The blood was just gushing over my face, you know, and it was like, what the hell? It was hysterical. But uh, but sure enough, the death scene was one take. I mean, I got up from that and the director was just like, that's great. OK. He said, and he said, that's going to be in the movie. <laughs> that's so. dope. Yeah, I love hearing those behind the scenes takes and what and then how like stuff gets into the to the film, or, like how much improv is there, or how much is, like actually part of the script, or like how much people change. Um, I can't remember who I was talking to. It had something to do with uh, uh Batman. I think it was Roger Craig Smith who was talking about how he he put his input into uh, uh the script sometimes when he felt like it really wasn't a part of the character. And and I just I love when actors like do that or like have a really good take and then the director is like you knocked it out the park and that's we're not doing that again you're good <laughs> so I yeah. just love crazy stories like that. My first question to you is though is what was your childhood environment like and how would you say that influenced your career decisions moving forward? Well, um, you know we well I was we were a traditional sort of middle class family, albeit that. Sadly, my, my mother um, was institutionalized when I was young, when I was like five years old and never got out of institutions. So that was, that certainly colored a whole bunch of what happened to me. And I've often reflected back to think that, you know, uh, and my mother was a paranoid schizophrenic. So uh, one of the things that I've often thought about was like me as an actor. I, I really was taken to acting when I was younger because it was a chance for me to be somebody else, in, inhabit somebody else's skin. And I don't know if that is a direct correlation to uh, that uh, fact of 
you know, my childhood. But um, what I would say is, is on the upside is uh, my father, um, you know, I'm, I'm the only uh, actor artist in my entire family. And my mother was like, you know, one of 17. So I got a whole bunch of cousins and everybody else and no, nobody in my family has been or you know, ever was an actor. So a couple of things. Number one is my father was uh, extremely liberal in that he, he never pushed us to do anything. He was like, hey, is that what you want to do? Okay, I'll support you. You go for it. You just, but he, do, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't let you just like say it and then slouch it. You know, he'd say, so how's that coming? <laughs> you know, wh what are you doing? Um, and it, on top of that, the funniest thing in my life was, was, you know, when you're small and you're, you're there, your uncles, your aunts, your grandmas, and they say, so baby, what, what is it you want to be when you grow up? And, you know, every, we all get that question. And when I was real little, I was like, oh, I'm going to be a fireman or, you know, I'm going to be a policeman, right? Or, you know, um, and of course, you always felt uncomfortable saying it because it was like, I don't really want to be a fireman, right? <laughs> Even though firemen are great and we need them. <laughs> One day, uh, like my dad was, he was liberal, but strict. Like he, he didn't want us watching TV. So he restricted us to two hours of TV a week. And, and you could choose. You know, you could choose your spot and, you know, what you were going to watch and nobody could, you know, take it away from you. Like that was your time. So I always went for Saturday mornings. I went from the cartoons at nine and then the Bowery Boys, which was an old fashioned TV show about a gang of kids in the Lower East Side of Manhattan in the Bowery. And uh, Leo Gorsi, who was a pretty famous actor at the time, he was the star of it. And there was a character in there, and I can't remember his name, but his, uh, the character's name was Satch. And he was just, he was like the goofball of the gang. And man, he just would make me laugh like crazy. And one day, you know, I, was, I had my allotted two hours. I watched the Bowery Boys for an hour. And they were, they were little films, right? I went running down. I was like eight years old. Went running down to my dad's office. I'm like, Dad, Dad, I know what I'm, I want to be. I know what I want to be. He says, oh, yeah, really? Well, what is that? I said, I'm going to be a movie actor. And my father almost fell out of his office chair. He was just like, oh, man, you got to be kidding. And I was like, no, seriously, seriously. And he said, well, OK, son, that, that's, a, that's a great thought. And I've had to remind him of it since because, you know, how prophetic that was that I said that at an early age and then when I actually came true and I've done had to do a bunch of other things I have done a bunch of things in my life in terms of making money but uh I had to remind my dad I said dad you remember that day and you laughed at me and uh he said yeah you know he said that's really odd but uh there you go I believe in like you know whatever comes out of your mouth like you speak it and you can speak things into reality you know, you put it out there in the cosmos, into the universe. It's like my, my uh, young nephew, uh, <clears throat> when he was four, his parents are, like my brother-in-law is a uh, seven-time Grammy winner, a jazz pianist, and his wife is a concert pianist. And bringing the boys up, they were like, okay, you guys, if you're going to be musicians, you have to start with the piano and you have to do your piano. And my nephew was like, no. I'm a trumpeter. I'm a trumpeter. I don't want to play the piano. And they would look at him like, what? You did? Go, go play the piano. And he would, he would do it begrudgingly. But sure enough, I mean, this kid is, he, he's going to be ultra famous. I mean, he, he, he plays the trumpet like nobody I've ever seen. And I've seen Miles Davis, uh, you know, and Miles Davis, of course, is one of the great greats. But trust me, my my nephew is going to be hit the stratosphere. He's amazing. And the amazing thing about that is, is that uh, he spoke it. I mean, he spoke, he said it and he said it loud. So that's a little tip I can give to anybody out there. It's like, you know, you want to bring something into your life, tell everyone about it. <laughs> like, don't be shy about it. Speak it out loud and you'll probably manifest it. So that, that, that that's for free, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. We have a lot in common with our childhood structure, how stuff happens, like uh, how things have changed. You said, oh, you wanted to be a fireman. Well, for me, I wanted to be the president of the United States. And I 
read my history books. I know the three branches of government. Nowadays, I can't even tell you one. But uh, no, I'm kidding. But you know, I I just knew so much, and I and and like things change. You know, you wanted to be an actor at a young age, and I I don't know. Me nowadays, I'm like getting into voice acting now, which we're gonna talk about your voice acting too. But I'm always as a little kid drawn to voices. I'm a huge, I'm a huge, huge Transformers fan. I love Transformers, and my and I would just always try and do impressions of every Transformer from Optimus Prime to Bumblebee. And and it is true if you speak it out into existence, it'll come. Like there's just so much that I've spoken. I'd be like, you know, this is gonna happen. Or or one time, oh gosh, I, I started to make it about me, but no, when, please. When, when I there was this time where I was like really frustrated. I tried to get this interview. I was like, oh, this isn't gonna happen. And then I like switched my thought and I said, no, this is gonna happen. And I just felt like a reaction in my body. It was like a physical reaction. Yeah. And I and I can't. I don't forget that day. The interview hasn't happened yet, but here's like. I don't know, like I've never that's never happened to me before. Like I felt it. I've never like physically felt. It's so weird. It's so weird, but it is true. Speak it and it, it'll come. It'll definitely come. Your time will come. Absolutely. When you do feel it, it resonates. I mean that that there's a truth to it, right? If you say it and it's empty, it'll be empty. But if you're really passionate about it and you really I mean I mean, I remember so vividly that day. And you don't even know it possesses you, you know, you don't even know. Um and how could I have said that at eight? when I was just a kid playing basketball and messing around, you know? Um, but it's funny how things in my life uh, came about, you know? It, it, it's, it's as serendipitous as, you know, I went to a small state school in Maryland for college, right? My freshman year, walking through the student union building, I saw this little placard on the wall that said, study abroad uh, for a semester. And I was like, wow, let me, let me take one of those. And I sent off for it and got the perspectives and bam, it was like, wow. In this program, I could have studied the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. And I was like, whoa, okay. Because I started acting young, gave it up to play basketball. And then when I was in college, um, there was a requirement. You know, you have the extracurricular things you got to do. And it's like, okay, I had my choice of it was like Theater 101. And I was like, oh, okay, that'll be an easy A. I'll do that. Well, I didn't realize that, you know, I was going to get cast as a lead in the play. And I was bitten by the bug again. And that took me to England. Now, when I went to England, I didn't actually get to go to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. But when I was there, uh, the school that I was at, Richmond College, um, a woman uh, who was leading the theater department, her husband was a fairly prominent theater and television actor. Anton Rogers is his name. And uh, he, she got him to come and direct us in some uh, one-act plays. And from meeting him, he then pulled me aside and said, so what are you doing when this finishes? I said, well, I guess I'll go back and finish my degree. And he was like, "Uh, -uh. no, no, no. You're staying in England. You're going to get trained professionally. And I was like, really? You you know, so he's and and he did. He coached me through my professional acting schools. I got in everywhere except for the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. That's crazy how life happens like that. Yeah. It really is. This is really interesting to me when I talk to people who come from a theater or acting background, how they they do a ton of voices. They're in a lot of voice acting stuff. And I wanted to ask you uh, specifically, how did voice acting get introduced into your life since you come from being on screen and being in movies like Aliens and stuff like that? Yeah, um, it was amazing. When I was in drama school at the place called the Drama Center, which is famous for people like Tom Hardy and Michael Fassbender and Colin Firth all went there. In fact, when I was leaving, Colin Firth was just coming into the school. Um, But when I was in my first year of it was like a three year conservatory. Um, First year, somebody had called the school to say, hey, do you have any American actors there? Because we're looking for a young American voice to revoice Jackie Chan in his early Kung Fu film. So that was, and I booked the job. I got it. And all I knew of Jackie Chan was was just from watching was like, wow, this is this tremendous guy. He does all these crazy, uh, you know, stunts and fighting and stuff. And the movies were always cute and had a comic edge to them. And I ended up doing like three of them. 
And then when I was doing Rush Hour with Jackie on a day when, like, Jackie's amazing, man, because, like, when they, they say cut, like, he doesn't leave the set and go sit in his chair and act like he's somebody. He will stay planted on his mark. He won't move. So I was like, wow, why is Jack? So I, I thought, well, can't you leave the star of the movie? Like, I got to you know, go chat with him. I said, like, Jackie, so why? You, you don't need water or anything? He's like, no, 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 waste of time. I stay right here, right here. I was like, oh, okay, that's cool. I said, well, you mind if I chat with you? No, okay. So I told him, I said, look, um, when I was younger, I revoiced you in Drunken Monkey and Drunken Master and another title. And he was like, what? You? You revoiced me? No way, no way. And I was like, no way, way, really, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's the most amazing man. He is the most amazing man. I mean, not only being able to see him do the things that he does on the screen, but he is the, out of all the people I've ever worked with or met, he was an absolute impeccable gentleman. He, he threw like four parties for us. You, you know, normally you'd be lucky, like maybe maybe a star will throw you one party, right? Man, he threw four parties. I'm, 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 I don't mean just like, like meet us at a place and we'll kind of pal around. No, these are like full on, renting out the Hard Rock Cafe, all four floors of it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You walk in, the, the there was like that bank of seafood and food, and you could go, oh, I'll have that piece there and this there and <laughs> full open bar. I mean, it was phenomenal. We we stayed at this this Christmas party. Uh, we were there till like, wow, 4.30 in the morning. Uh, and when we walked in the door, I could see Jack, he had this white suit on and, you know, and he, he saw us come in the door and he excused himself from that group, came rushing across and he was like, Mark. And then he, I said, this is my wife, Georgina. He took her and he kissed her right on the lips. And she was like, oh my God. <laughs> He's like, I'm falling in love. And just amazing guy. Uh, absolutely amazing guy. Yeah. That's so cool. I'm a huge. I love Jackie Chan, I, but I think I've I've seen a lot of stuff. He's been in a lot of stuff uh, that I watched as a kid. I th I'm pretty sure it was an American Dragon. I'm pretty mm. sure it was in that. Uh, growing up, and then, oh uh, guys, I'm trying to remember. My memory is foggy. I don't, I hate that, but my memory is foggy and some things from my past. But I do remember uh, stuff like that. Or uh, I saw him in this new action movie that came out. I can't remember what it was, but it it, uh, it was a. Uh, be like fighting aliens or something. I can't. I can't remember. But I, I, Jackie Chan seems like a really cool guy, and it's really, oh. it's really awesome to hear stories like that about like these big name actors. Because sometimes there's like a stigma that oh they're not really nice or that 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 all big Hollywood stars are jerks and mean. Some of them are, <laughs> but for the most part, it's it's just awesome to know that there there are big name people out there who are just like really caring and that's not oh absolutely it's like, absolutely i looked at your page on behind the voice actors and it says here that your first voice acting role was on a show called starfleet as john lee and communications officer one what was that experience like and what did it teach you about the voice acting field well now the, now that was after i did the voice work on jackie but it was you'd imagine it's a proper uh, voiceover job because it was a, it's a cartoon and uh, it was directed by the same man who did the dubbing work for, for Jackie's movies. Um, a man called Louis Elman, uh, amazing. He's still, still around and kicking. And he, he, he's probably responsible for me being uh, very proficient at uh, certainly at dubbing and voiceover in general. But yeah, um, I'll never forget this little orange-haired, roly-poly little kid. And his, his name was Johnny Lee. And he was, <laughs> you know, and, and he, he was a little bit shy, but... Um, and that, you know, you got, it worked for the character. And, uh, yeah, Johnny Lee. And so on the back of Johnny Lee, I bought myself a yellow Citroen de Chevaux. You know, that's, that's like the little tin box cars. They don't have them here in America, but they have them all over <laughs> Europe. Um... But yeah, I, I bought a yellow one in, in, in to thank Johnny Lee because the work I did on there paid for it. <laughs> and my first car, my first car. Wow, that's so cool. Oh, yeah. wow. But Starfleet's a great series, man. If you've, if you've not seen it, it, it's fantastic. You know, it's, uh, it, it, and again, it's, it's a bit of classic animation or animatronic or not animatronic, but what do they call it? And it wasn't claymation. I guess it was like animatronic stuff. 
No. Yeah, man, animatronic means it's like a robot, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's, it was, how would you say? Yeah, it is um, play, claymation. Yeah, those little clay yeah, things. Stop, right? max, stop action, yeah. Yeah, stop motion. Yeah, stop motion. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I have a ton of friends who are into stop motion. I'm thinking about uh, getting into it at some point, but they. <laughs> I'll never forget, we were watching a stop motion in, 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 um, in my English class, and I was talking to one of my best friends. He's in lives in Tennessee now, but he was just talking about how he did it before, and he was like, Josh, man, this took me like two weeks don't don't do it i was like oh my god two weeks dude. because you know you gotta like you gotta pose them you gotta get the feet in the right position and it's just like ah it's too much hey, it's oh yeah and you can't move <laughs> like, the you, you can't move the camera either because otherwise the frame will be completely different yeah yes oh my gosh yes and it's it's so cool to see how it comes together but man mm. the grind <laughs> the work grind to get it done it, it just it just seems insane <laughs> the main reason i really wanted to bring you on here talk to you about is i really wanted to talk to you about deathstroke i am a massive fan of your deathstroke um you're you're my second favorite my first is a uh, ron perlman in uh, the titans cartoon. i don't know if you saw the teen times cartoon mm -hmm. <laughs> The uh, early 2000s, early to mid to uh, early 2000s is when it came out. He did a really good job. But I remember just like the suit was cool. And I love that suit. I love Deathstroke's suit and Batman Arkham Origins. I just wanted to know how did the role of such an iconic character in the comic books get uh, on your radar? Uh, well, um, it, it was really just through uh, the audition process. And in fact, just to be clear, um, for that role, I uh, I only did the voice only. I, I didn't do any of the motion capture work. That was all done in Toronto by uh, some stuntmen, which is why I, I have to admit, I mean, man, I remember seeing just clips of that and just being blown away. The technology uh, is so cinematic in that game. Um, and from that, it's hard to believe that the technology is even advancing you know it's like a million times a year they say and i know it to be true because i recently did a head scan for something i'm starring in which i can't tell you what the name is but i yeah i i, I can't and but, yeah, uh, i get it i know some hmm. some boys people told me about like the what's in some ndas and it's just crazy <laughs> like, oh yeah it's, yeah it's bad you don't you, you don't want to you don't want to do that no so, uh, but 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 to tell you man i i i did uh a head scan for th this new game, which we should be starting up soon. We're supposed to start up last year, but of course, COVID put the kibosh to that. Um, but the interesting thing is, is that um, this gentleman, when I was doing this head scan, he actually has, he's only one or two people in the world. He has a technology whereby he can put uh, you in a, a volume, like a geodesic dome, right? With these 4D... 4k video cameras yeah and he showed me on his phone a test they did of like imagine a split screen actor here digital creation here and when this actor spoke the digital creation simultaneously did the exact same thing and hid the computers he has are so powerful he can do an instant almost instantaneous transmission it's 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 extraordinary so that is you know i've always said it it's like you know my dad my dad was a computer programmer for ibm and he always said to me even when i was you know wanting to be an actor well too i'll tell you the best thing my father ever said to me before going to drama school i said dad you know i've, I've been i've been in college for a year i said dad i think i made a decision i think i'm gonna go to acting school and he said well you know it, it could be a hard road to hoe but he said um advent of technology is going to just exponentially increase and a lot of people aren't going to be smart enough to get up off the couch and you know not watch the tv so they might as well watch you <laughs> and i i thought wow what, what a cool way of looking at it no i went off on a little tangent there um <laughs> i did sorry um but basically say the technology is such that, and my dad knew it then. My dad used to say to me all the time, he'd say, hey, you know, computer, they're going to have a computer actor. And I said, Pop, there's no way because you can't capture the nuance of human emotion, right? Just 
on a with a computer creation because it's only as good as what you put in, right? And uh, he said, well, I don't know. He said, we already have a computer that has, this is way back when, that has 2,000 world vocabulary. It's like, well, that's the reason why it won't work is the emotion part. But now this guy has this technology that could capture me doing what I do, like giving emotion to a, a, a role, a character, and have it be able to be transmitted in 4K, 4D, it's like, this This will be the future of movies. You watch. And what's even more fascinating is is the guy, I'm going to go uh, next month, and he, for free, he's going to put me into the full body scan and allow me to, he's going to create all the data of me full body. So then I can license my data. And say, for example, if I'm starting up another project and people need a digital reference, I said, well, you know, you don't really need to pay for the studio and everything else. I got the data. I can, it's, it's, it's mind blowing. Yeah. It's really, in, uh, to talk about technology, it's just so interesting to see and just like <clears throat> such, so shocking to see how technology has progressed and like just things have been like growing. It's so crazy to see. Yeah how far um, mo motion capture and has come. Um, it's gone from like balls on your, like everywhere, like you're wearing a suit to they just need you. Like you don't need a suit, they just need you and you're off to the races. Like that is, oh, yeah. is so cool. Yeah, but, that's the thing. It's like with this new technology, I won't even have to wear your, uh, the game I'm about to do, I they're using the, previous version of technology so i do have to wear the suit <laughs> with the balls on it <laughs> but but the 4d stuff that's the amazing thing about it um the computer will capture every nuance and angle of you so that'll be a thing of the past i'm gonna play a quote <coughs> from deathstroke Here's the game is over before it even begins yeah i will make this painless surprising huh Try something else. Now, this is a few quotes of like, really <coughs> just like cool, and he had a grunts, and that battle in Arkham Origins is freaking difficult, and it makes me upset to this day because no matter how many times I play the game, I always get stuck on that mission, and <laughs> it, it's it's so, and it's just so cool, and I love Deathstroke, and and that version of his costume is my all-time favorite. Like, if that's not Deathstroke's costume or project. I'm very disappointed. I really love that costume. And even in movies now, you see Joe Manganiello wearing that costume from the video game in the movies. Um, so, like, how do you feel to be, like, a part of this character that has influenced, like, costumes and, and just how he's been ingested into the uh, media? The whole world, all the world of, you know, DC and Marvel is really amazing. And I think it's best served by technology like this you know whether whether it's gaming or whether it's movies you know they're, they're, they're otherworldly they're creating a whole new reality you know there's a real freedom in that too because you can create more than what the reality might be in a certain medium and create it into something else completely and deathstroke i have to say i mean i love the people over at warner brothers who did all the recording i mean they were just amazing amazing people and just had a ball i mean like, like you know Little old me, white guy from Baltimore, is giving voice to ooh, Deathstroke. I mean, it's it, it's phenomenal. I love voice work. I love it. I do a lot of it. I've been doing tons of foreign television series and films for Netflix. That I am so proficient at. I know I'm probably one of the best around uh, doing uh, film dubbing. Um, of course, the voiceover field is extremely competitive. So I'm lucky to have been in like the Batman cartoon series. I was Firefly. Uh, very recently, I was Lex Luthor in the Young Justice series, which is which is a fantastic show. And we had like three seasons. And sadly, <clears throat> after which we were brought back to do the third season. And we thought we were going to start rolling. And then Warner Brothers inexplicably uh, went south on us. So we're not doing another season. But um, well, maybe. Uh, we're not yeah, I know. Never. I know. But maybe if the fan base does what they did before. You see, after we finished two and they dropped us the fan base is what got its back because people were starting to watch reruns of our show uh in the hundreds of thousands to where warner Bros. like hey this is really silly of us not to capture this fan base honestly playing lex luther 
that was money. <laughs> I can't believe what that is so un. Oh, <laughs> dang it! That's yeah. re- that's I really love <laughs> Young Justice, and there's a ton of story to be told. Like the ending of Young Justice season three ends on like a cliffhanger because I, I don't know if you've seen the actual show uh, i have for okay sure. oh, that's great yeah because sometimes when i talk to voice actors they're like oh they don't get to see the stuff they're in sometimes so but no it ends with like the ring for the legion of superheroes so they, there's so much that that's really that's and really they did fun. it they did it purposefully because we were sure that we were going to come back again. So I don't know what transpired, but um, but uh, yeah, they let it go. Who, who's to know? I mean, you see, what happens is is you could get a regime change uh, in the you know executive level, and a new executive comes in and goes, ah, what what is this thing? Like you know, and and just arbitrarily, it happens. They they arbitrarily just get rid of it. Um, look, I mean, <laughs> you know, the powers that be, you know, don't always know right they don't know in fact i love my manager she has a little caption that's on all of her email transmissions or social media transmissions um she goes like and it goes like this it's like nobody knows anything right because you don't you know you have no idea that something's going to be a hit you have no idea and then the thing you wouldn't think would be a hit becomes a monster hit so for example Shawshank Redemption. Shawshank. I knew it was a good script, but all of us collectively had no idea that it'd become this ostensibly one of the most loved films of all time. You know, it's it's weird to even say that, but that's what I you know I see like polls and whatever else. But none of us knew, and none of us knew even when we went to the premiere that it was going to do well. And think of it: when we opened, we had great reviews horrible box office i mean pretty dismal box office if it wasn't for dvds back then we would we wouldn't it wouldn't be the same film we we were saved by dvds seriously and then and and i went to an event uh in mansfield ohio where we shot shawshank and the director frank darabont was uh, was said openly in this open uh, um, uh question and answers thing that we did was that if shawshank was brought up to studio executives now never get made they wouldn't give they wouldn't wouldn't give you the money for it but if you went to some executives now and you had a new marvel character that you were you you probably get some money <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's exactly let's um for example Zack Snyder's Justice League just came out. Um, people are loving and raving about it. I'm, I'm going to watch it uh, after this interview. I'm, I'm really excited. But people pushed for that since the 2017 version, and people knew what happened behind the scenes between Zack and Warner Brothers and stuff being cut and things being reshot. And there was a ton of fan pushback. And you're right. Executives don't know. People don't know. I mean, even people don't know. Like, Guardians of the Galaxy, for example. I, people remember when that movie first got announced, and they thought it was going to be a flop and a waste of time. Now look at it. People regard those movies as some of the best Marvel films of all time. Yeah, so Guardians. Really no, and it, it, it's, it's, it's crazy. So true. So true. Mm-hmm. Have you, um, I, I want to know, because I got to speak to uh, Roger Craig Smith, who voiced Batman. Did you get to meet him? No. <sighs> no, they kind of record you. They were, there weren't group sessions. It was uh, just me doing Deathstroke. Yeah. yeah. Dang. Okay, well... Oh, uh, or like I wish I had, but yeah, but yeah, that, that that's the that's the thing about voiceover too is quite often, um, you, sometimes a, a company will have a whole group of people come in together because then you can really feed off each other, um, but quite often it's just it's you're on your own, right. yeah, yeah. I just did a uh, a session for another title I can't talk about, but big one big one and i created a new character um and it was interesting because with zoom they were able to bring in uh some other characters so you could interact other actors so you could interact with them it was interesting another thing to look forward to but i'm sorry i mean i know people will hear, hear that like i can't say what it is but really like you alluded to you know i've signed an nda yeah y- y- i wish y- i could y- 
these NDAs are are very. Uh, I was talking to David Sobolov, who is another big voice actor. I think he was in. I think it was like a World of Warcraft video game. It was some like uh, RPG where you like move around video game. And he said that in one of the um, lines in the NDA, he said that he had to pay $2.3 million if he broke it. So I'm 100% sure if someone told you you had to pay $2.3 million if you even spoke of this project, you'd keep your mouth shut. <laughs> so, yeah. I think so. Another popular character uh, to talk about Young Justice, um, Lex Luthor. You really knocked it out of the park as Lex Luthor. I, I oh, really have you. to say. Um, sometimes when people come to legacy characters like Lex Luthor or ba Batman, for example, or I, I'm very, or, or Joker, I'm very, I, I, I don't want to say against it, but I'm hesitant because I'm so used to how it's played because Lex Luthor is famously played by Clancy Brown. And I'm so used to that voice. So I grew up with that voice. Or when uh, someone who is in Kevin Conroy is played as Batman, Batman, I'm hesitant because like I grew up with that voice, but you you really knocked it out of the park with Injustice and and Young Justice. And I was just surprised at how like well I'm not not to say you're a bad vo actor or voice actor. You're completely far from that. Very very great of the work you do, but it's just you know sometimes I'm hesitant, and you really knocked it out of the park. And I'm really glad that you were in um, Young Justice. I wanted to ask a question about a scene in Young Justice. There was a scene where Lex was at the United Nations and mm. <laughs> he said they were like bringing up a bunch of claims against him and he said fake news. I want to ask, was that inspired by real life? It was? Okay. That's all I want yeah. to know. We, we'll just leave it there. <laughs> we'll just leave it there. To, to <laughs> we'll just leave it there. No, it wasn't. I remember, I remember that scene in particular. I said, wow, this is very... Trump-esque and they were like yeah I said well how far are we going to go with this and uh, there were a couple improv things that, that uh, didn't make it but um, for fun they let me go for it but um, <laughs> yeah 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 it was very much like that well then and then I think that's the thing that made that show uh, topical because they did lace it with stuff that was happening in the world today and you know when the audience draws the parallel, you know, they, 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 they go, oh, wow, that's so like, you know, you know, and then that's what makes that thing work. You know, you, if, if you treat your audience like they're, they're dummies, they're going to turn off. They'll turn off. But when you treat an audience with respect and give them something intelligent, you know, something to chew on, then that, that's what makes, you know, longevity and a great show. Absolutely. What is your favorite moment voicing Lex from Injustice and Young Justice? Oh, wow. That's a big question. Um, <laughs> you know, I, the thing I love most about Lex is that he's just deliciously wicked, but at the same time, he's even above his own wickedness. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't try very hard. He easily gets, you know, bored with the people around him because they're just not smart enough. But... Um, I, I love that most about the character. I mean, he was so wicked. He didn't even care how wicked he was. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm a huge Lex Luthor fan. And again, top hats off to you for how well you did with that character. And it's a real shame that... Here's hoping that, like, we hear you in, like, an Injustice 3. Who knows? And they bring back Lex Luthor and, and that you could do the voice again. But, um... Yeah. Switching over from the DC universe to the Marvel universe, I want to talk about Norman Osborn. Now, that's a character that I've always, <laughs> I've always had a bit of venom towards because of the way he treats Harry in a lot of iterations and just the way he acts in general, particularly Spider-Man PS4, where in the scene, um, you probably remember this, where he was taking away the guy where uh, Otto Octavius put the arm on, the, the prosthetic arm, and he was like, oh, come with, come with us to uh, Osborne uh, Prosthetics or something. We'll give you this free of charge. And, and it, it was just like, uh, you're, 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 uh, you're scum. You're acting like, you're, <laughs> you're, you're making me mad. And um, I just wanted to ask, is that you in the mocap? Because he looks really like, okay, that's all. Totally me. That's, that's all me. That's okay. all me. And that's another... Uh, 
um, amazing group of people to work with, you know, at Insomniac Games. I mean, they, you know, we, we had a fantastic ensemble. All the actors were very seasoned actors, and uh, but we were also given free reign to really explore the characters completely. And um, my wife always says to me, she's like, you know, you know, cause I'm, it's something I've always tried to do. It's like, when I do my first take, I I'm on, I mean, I'm, I'm on fire. And, you know, and usually I hit it so, so good that people are like, oh, that, oh, well, <laughs> there you go. We don't need to do any more, right? And my wife keeps telling me, she says like, say, why don't you just fuck a few things up? Why don't you just take some time and like mess some things up so you can be there longer and make more money. I was like, I can't really do that. You see, because they would break up uh, like, a, like a, a, a day's work, like in two sessions, like two four hour sessions. Well, theoretically, if, if I wasn't getting it right, yeah, I could work in the afternoon too and make double the money, but it was like, it just is not in my nature. Mm -hmm. And it's really down to uh, people like John Frankenheimer, who I had the ch uh, chance to work with, who not only loved actors, but he complimented me once. He, he was he's like, you know, you're one of the only actors I've ever met who like, y you hit it the first time out, right? And uh, I love that. Cause I, I've always, I've always uh, acted as if, uh, you know, I'm in a boxing match and you know, it's right there. You got to duke up and do it right then, right there, and hit it. Otherwise, you're gonna get hit, right? That that's part of my approach. That's really dope. How you like you're yeah. just really into. But the but character. but 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 further, do you think Norman Norman Osborn? See, this is the beauty of the way they, and I mean, the director and the writers developed Norman Osborn. Of course, I had the requisite mustache twirling part to him, but the whole end of that when he's dealing with his son, who's in you know that sort of the the life-giving tank or whatever the, the stuff is you know you saw the human side of him as well osborne it, it was really really well done and and and, and all the other the, the other actors like bill sayers and uh yuri are were just amazing spoilers for anyone who has not finished mama's morales or hasn't played it at the end of it we see um so click off or whatever cover your ears or something but at the end we see norman tell them hey He's been in there long enough. I'm I'm getting frustrated. Take him out. Take him out. Like it's it's time. So obviously there's a future for this character. What do you want to see them do next? Wow. Um, I mean, you know, it's 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 really not for me to say because from the initial game, they did a spin-off for I can't remember the kid's character, but the younger character. Miles Morales, yes. I'm really just waiting to see, you know, what what they come up. I mean, I, I hope hope they come up with something that includes me. Obviously, if they were to follow the Norman Osborn story, he becomes the Green Goblin. So we'll have to see. Would you be down to get on the glider and put on the hat and <laughs> do, oh, do all that? Oh, man. Yeah. I would eat that stuff up. Absolutely. See, because it's fascinating for me. It's like eight years ago, I started doing the gaming stuff. And a lot of my buddies, you know, said to me, like, wow, dude, like, everything okay? Like, you're doing games? Like, and I, I said, well, you know, you ought to check it out because the gaming world is way bigger than the movie world. And, I mean, it blows it out of the park, right? Um, and for me, I'm getting older, obviously, and still still kicking it. But in Hollywood terms, it's like there'll be fewer and fewer roles. Everything is more sort of young-centric. So being able to still do my thing in the gaming world and in Spider-Man just being asked to play Norman Osborn, it's like, it's, it's fantastic. You know, these, I mean, because they are iconic characters. They're iconic. So you really have to come and imbue them with not only the history of, of the character, but also, you know, with all the flavor and stuff. Because it's like shooting a movie. You know, it's like shooting a movie. And, and it was fascinating for me, because I came from the theater, you know, when you're when you're filming, you're in this big rectangular room. They call it the volume. And when you step into the volume, you've got 360 cameras filming every possible angle of you. And you're synced up to a computer that's just following you and everything you do. So it's kind of like acting in the round, you know, theater in the round. Um, and when it, you're doing theater in the round, there's no escaping. You have to be on all the time. Because if you let, let now see, now, now if you're in a proscenium arch 
show, right, where you have a backstage and the wings, well, you can cheat. <laughs> there are ways to cheat. You know, you can escape to the wings for one, but you can also turn upstage and turn your back to the audience, right? But in the round, in the, in the gaming world, there's no cheating. If, if you let off at all, ca the camera tells all. The camera picks up all. Yeah. I'm genuinely excited for the future of this character. Obviously, there's there's there's, there's going to be a sequel. It's just a matter of when you guys get to it. Um, Miles Morales was a nice little yeah little, little little sprinkle until we get to the main course, of course. And well, it's I interesting because these games, uh, you know, the time and money that goes into them is extraordinary. But uh, it's the time. You know, it can take two and a half, three years, and more like from, from inception to final product. Um, and the thing that I've learned about uh, the gaming world is, is that especially for, you know, whoever the producing company is, is if you got a smash hit, the next one has to be better than. Has to be. Because all the audience, they're going to they're, they're want to see all the extras and something new that, you know, is going to excite them. If you just do the same sort of routine, the same sort of, you know, a uh, storyline or uh, uh, you'll lose them in a, in a heartbeat. So yeah. it's an exciting world to be in. I'm really honored. And, uh, um, you know, cause I always thought like when I started acting, um, I thought I really want to be like the famous r French writer, playwright Moliere. Now Moliere, he actually died on stage of a heart attack at the age of like 74 or something. But for me, I've always said, people say, so, you know, wh when are you going to retire? And it's like, I'm not retiring. Why? Why? <laughs> this is what I love and this is what I do. So I've always had in mind that I, I, I'll work. And when I was young, I thought, you know what? I want to be like Moyer. I want to be 90 years old and die of a heart attack on stage. Like, that would be, that'd be amazing for me. I honestly, honestly, really would be, um, because I don't know what it is that uh, bit me or came into my life that gave me this this life that I've had. But uh, it's it's something else. I'm telling you, I'm I'm very very lucky and very blessed. You've done an amazing job, man. I really mean mm. that. It's, you've done really well, and it's really awesome to hear when you're announcing new films or doing something new. And I'm really excited for what you are. Uh, yeah, have yeah. Done. Things are coming. Things are coming. Trust me. Um, you know, you got an awful lot of fans on here. They're saying that Drake didn't die from the acid splash. Yeah, I did. <laughs> because the aliens had acid for blood. That was the whole thing. Or. It is another possibility that maybe uh, Vasquez, when she was getting into the APC, that she accidentally, you know, some friendly fire hit me as well. But no, I died of alien acid. Blood. Did you keep, did, uh, have you kept up with the alien franchise since you were last in it as Drake? Um, you mean watching the movies? Yes. Eh. Nah. Nah. Sorry. I think, I mean, nah. I get, I, I understand. Um, a lot of them recently have been sort of hit or miss. Um, of course, they had like Alien versus Predator, which was big back in the day, even though it, it just got like, it got stupider as it went on, if I'm being yeah. Really you know, it's fascinating though. I remember saying to Jim Cameron, I said, so Jim, are you gonna do another one? He's like, hell no, no, that's it, done. He said, no, I, 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 he said, first of all, it's so rare that a sequel be better than the the original and even though i'm not taking anything away from alien because alien is a brilliant movie as well um but i think it was topped by aliens and after that it's like where would you go and i think maybe that's why jim you know was very concerned that no no this was i want this to be a standalone piece of mine um of course now <laughs> he's off in New Zealand making Avatar 2, 3, 4, and 5. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> but uh, he also said to me he's going to do these next four movies and he's done. Because um, this will take him quite a while to put all that together. But 
yeah, very, very honored to to be in that franchise. God bless Bill Paxton and God rest his soul. He was the most amazing guy. And Bill was responsible for getting me out to Hollywood just through sheer uh, uh, pestering me to get on a plane because I was living in London, right? And he would pester me to come to the premiere. And he kept saying, Mark, it's going to be huge, dude. You got to come, man. I'm telling you. And I was, I said, yeah, but you know, my son's little and, you know, I'm sort of working here in England and he's like, no, no, man. And then finally he was like, you can stay in my apartment. You can stay in my apartment. <laughs> and sure enough, man, Bill Paxton, love, what, what a, what a tremendous guy. I and mean, there's such great memories of that shoot. You know, we're still in touch with, you know, people in the cast and, uh, yeah, it was a few years back maybe like three years that uh, Jim Cameron had a big event at the San Diego Comic-Con. We had a, all had to get together. They had a separate Q and A with just Sigourney and Jim and be really sort of genuine and give a heartfelt thanks to all of us. Cause he said, going back to what we said before, he had no idea aliens would turn out i'm sure he had a vision for it but he had no idea it would turn out the way it did and he he alluded to like just how many different departments in that film had to be firing on all cylinders to to have a film like that and, I, and, I, and i'm sorry you know shawshank is a classic film but aliens is a classic film <laughs> classic yeah yeah so out of the three characters that you voiced that we've talked about lex Deathstroke and Norman, who is your favorite? Well, you know, it's a real close, uh, uh, you know, back and forth between Norman and Lex. I mean, because Lex is, I don't know, he's juicy. So, but undertaking Norman, like he's he's equally as juicy. I, I, I kind of have to say Norman because there's more of a human side, you know, Lex, as I experienced him in the way the writers, you know, uh, presented him, he, he's cold. He doesn't appear to have a human side. He is human, but doesn't affect him that way. Whereas Osborne, I think, is a, a better rounded character because he's, I'm sure he's calculating and he's he's evil, but um, but yeah, but he has that human element, and that's the thing, man. That's the thing. Um, you know, when you think about. Um, 3D movies and, uh, um, uh, you know, and when they first came out, you know, it would be like, wow, they could create this character digitally and this world digitally. But the thing that was missing was, was eyeballs. You notice all those characters had dead eyes. And that's because they can't capture the fluctuation of your eye. Your eyeball is moving at a rate that you can't detect with a human eye. So without that, it's not completely real. But guess what Jim Cameron is doing? There's a big surprise coming in the Avatar movie. Oh, Apparently, he has found a way to capture the fluctuations of the eyeball, and I can't wait to see it. Oh, nice. Yeah. Now, we're getting into the fun part of the interviews called Weird <laughs> and Wacky. Um, okay. We have... Um, one minute to answer a series of weird and random and just off the wall questions. Uh, no one has gotten to uh, the record of 15 questions answered, but the championship holder, Simon Norfley, has come up with a record of 14 questions answered. Do you think you could beat him? Okay, now when I can answers be one word? Yeah, that's oh. one word, sentence, whatever. Just answer it. <laughs> Let's give it a go. Let's see. Let's see. All right, I'm about to start the timer. And how, how long do I have? One minute. Damn, man. Can you, <laughs> can you, can you give me a minute and 10 seconds? <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. I'm teasing. <laughs> All right, I'm about to start the timer in three, All right. two, one. Longest time period without taking a shower? A week. Worst food you've ever eaten? England. Food you refuse to cook? Sushi. Video game that you had the most fun on? Uh, uh, Spider-Man. Biggest, biggest voice actor you got to meet? 
myself. <laughs> um, instrument you wish you knew how to play? The guitar. Uh, favorite movie growing up? Uh, to Start With Love. Song that you don't like? Who? Song that you do not like. Songs? Oh, God. Oh, uh, um, uh, the... Um, uh, 13, 12, oh, shit. Um, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, oh. 5, 4, 3. Won't do it. Won't do it. <laughs> so, uh, and it was that uh, the name was escaping me. It was uh, that big purple, stupid cartoon character. You know the song was "I love you, you love me." Barney. We Barney. Oh, yeah, Barney. Oh <laughs> man, that song when my when my girls were little, they had they had the Barney song going, and oh, it's <laughs> good. It, 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 it got in my brain and it would infect me for an entire day. Oh, <laughs> Barney couldn't come to mind. All I could remember was this big purple monster. Anyway, damn. How good. many? How many did I get? Uh, you got eight. You got eight. Dang. It's all right though. It's all right though. When I interview you for the Spider-Man sequel, you'll get it better. You'll do better because you'll be ready. Oh. Okay. <laughs> But now I got my last question. And before I ask, I just want to say thank you so much for coming out. I really had an awesome time getting to know more about your time in Hollywood and getting to know more about you. It really is truly an honor to be speaking to you. And thank you so much for taking the time out of your day. Oh, my really pleasure. Really my pleasure, man. My last question to you is, what is your current message to the world during these current times that we live in? Obviously, we're living in a global pandemic. Laws are being changed. We had the tragic shooting in Atlanta with um and the massage parlors and there's just a ton of fear and people being afraid what would you say to people who are afraid and in need of hope well number one vote <laughs> vote uh number two is uh love others as you would wish to be loved right and on a political note um, my own personal opinion is we got to get rid of guns. We've got to get rid of them because um, there's some very interesting interpretations of the Second Amendment. And, you know, uh, former justice, um, oh God, it's going to escape me as well. There was a, a retired, he just passed away this past year. Um, there was a justice, I don't think it was Kennedy, but he um, he had written, he added words to different amendments that completely clarified their... Uh, um, Scalia? Uh, no, not Scalia. No, another former Supreme Court justice, not Scalia. He passed away not too long ago. Um, gosh. Anyway, um, he was a very liberal... Uh, Supreme Court justice, but he wrote this this thing where he added choice words to the uh, questionable amendments that clarified them. And when you think about the Second Amendment, you know it was it was all about being able to form a regulated militia because we thought the British were going to come back, and we had to have a way to unify to fight them. It wasn't about for people to have militias all around the country so they can do stupid shit like try and you know take over the government the like we did on january 6th but the whole bottom line is this, this is my opinion you know if there you without guns you can have any opinion or ideology you wish i could listen to you and, and go okay that's your opinion okay cool but, but as soon as you add guns into the mix, anybody who's, like they said the other day, which I find totally repugnant, the guy in, in Georgia was having a bad day. Re really? Really? That's the justification for what he did? And if he hadn't been able to go and purchase that gun, this tragedy may never have happened. Or just, just go back over the last five years, all the different tragedies that have happened because of guns. 
I want to go somewhere where there are no guns. I don't. I, I don't want guns. Like my dad, you know, he was former military, but he never. It never had guns in the house. He would never allow guns in the house. And back then, like when I grew up, like you know, you could do this. Nowadays, you can't even do this. You know, uh, so I'm. I want to go somewhere where you know, like, e like even in Germany. I remember when I've traveled to Germany. I've said to people there, it's it's like, like, do you all have guns? And they're like, well, yeah, there there are guns. He said, but, but if you want to have a gun yourself as a person, you have to pass a two year test, and then you're only allowed to carry a little revolver, not a semi automatic pistol, but a revolver. And you have that in your home for protection. Or you can go through like a one and a half year test and prove that you're a hunter. And you live in a rural part of Germany where you actually hunt. Because I, you know, I'm not for taking people's weapons away. If, if you want to go hunting and whatnot, that, that, that's your business. I wouldn't take it away. But who the hell needs an AR-15? <laughs> who, 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 need, who needs one? You know, if, if you shot an AR-15 at, 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 you know, on a hunting trip, you you'd obliterate your kill like you, <laughs> you <know? laughs> yes. what's the point you couldn't eat it you couldn't skin it i mean so what i would leave with people is like you know a please vote do not let them change uh uh voting laws in states do not allow them to to suppress vote because the reason why we finally that we got rid of and i'm going to say a bad word fuck face we got rid of fuck face was because we had a historic turnout yeah and when he won a lot of people decided you know this is a foregone conclusion there i'm not gonna bother voting i won't bother and then look we we had four years of just catastrophe and upset so now like it, it feels like it's new beginnings to me i think people should be hopeful but I think we are also, we ought to take the lesson in that you got to be active. You have to vote. And most of all, come on, man, let's start loving each other and just, and stop all this hate. Just, it's just, it, it, it upsets me. It's like, you know, I, I, my dad was part of the greatest generation. They did selfless things. The whole country did selfless things even down to children working in factories at that in the world wars right to 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 put down fascism and you know you think of all the things that we've believed in and the way that america has come to like like look i was always and i'm sorry if i'm going on too long but um but we uh, um you know we got to the moment where we had an african american president who was not only supremely intelligent, but brought us all together. And we made, and had he not been blocked at every turn, imagine, like, like, if you look at his record, he did amazing things in the face of obstruction, right? How do we go from that to like a flip side of like this complete obstruction and everything that they stood for was, wasn't American not american you can you can't go out and shoot eight people and call yourself a patriot you're a patriot because you believe in the second amendment it just doesn't make sense so i think that we need to make some changes and change will not come quickly change always takes a long time but for your generation my children's generation, my grandkids, I just pray that we latch on to what is good in the world and what really makes sense and and move forward and, and really be and really make America great again. You know, I mean, I hate to use his slogan. You know, but it's true. Like if 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 we all really come together, because it, it's a new thing for me. Like I've seen the division erupt, and it's always really it, it it just it just shocked me that we've gone from when I was coming up. I mean, really, we you know there was never a question about being 
proud about being American. But sadly, I'm embarrassed at times. I'm embarrassed. I certainly was embarrassed over the past four years. And now, you know, uh, President Biden, you know, I know he's old. I know he's white. But, but he's the right man for this time, right now. He's the right man. And he says it himself. He's a transitional person. And he is. He, you know, it's a transition from really the potential that we would have been an authoritarian state. And we still got to watch out because it can still happen. So please, that's my, my rant. But uh, truthfully, man, great spending time with you uh uh uh, best of luck with uh all your your voiceover uh acting and and your yeah um you should try doing some on camera stuff too man because you got a great face (laughs) well funny you should say that because my short film is coming out this thursday so i'm doing oh sweet so i'm doing a ton of acting work um i I just want to get in this field um but yeah just thank you so much for the compliments i really do appreciate it like i said i've been a fan of yours for a very long time mm-hmm. and it's really such such an honor to bring you on here so i'm thank really you, glad and um yeah hey guys thank you so much for coming to this interview mark is there anything you want to plug push out or put on before we head off wow sadly uh everything that i've got coming up um nda i i, I can't but uh <laughs> but be on the lookout be there, there I, i've got like two really big characters and some massive projects that i was told well one could be out could be out later this year if not in the spring and the other one that i'm about to start up of course that'll be another year and a half or two years before it's out but they're both things that i'm sure we'll have occasion to talk about again and i look forward to it absolutely all right guys thank you so much for coming i will see you guys tomorrow on my interview with yuri laurenthal at 2 p.m Oh man, give give Yuri give Yuri my love, man. Yuri is great guy to work with. Great, great actor. Uh, really sweet. Tell him I say hey. Very nervous. Um, my heart is in my stomach. So, uh, but I'm excited. Oh no, he, no, yo, not at all. Don't worry. Yuri is is an absolute gentleman and love. He's a sweet guy. Really great guy. You're gonna, you'll have a great interview. Have a blessed day and peace out, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Mm-hmm.